very good to be here again. Uh, this is, I believe, my fourth time at Carlisle, and um, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, can everyone hear me, first of all? Yes. 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 All right. Um, 100 years ago, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School closed its doors. And we are here to commemorate that century and uh, to reflect upon the school and the students who went there. There were a great many students and uh, they had an interesting career at Carlisle. The importance of Carlisle, I think, cannot be overestimated. It uh, is the prototype, as you know, of all the boarding schools that followed, many of them still in existence. And the boarding school chapter in the history of white Indian relations is a crucial chapter. The students either succeeded, as some of them clearly did, they benefited from the experience of Carlisle, or they were destroyed by by their association with the school. As, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, Richard Henry Pratt's motto was kill the Indian and save the man. Any motto, any, uh, anything of that kind which begins with kill the Indian has to be suspect. And so uh, it is uh, fitting that we should think back on the history of the school and what happened there. Um, the children who attended Carlisle are, they have gone home. Even those who remain here have gone home in a sense. The children who uh, passed through, through the gates of Carlisle are like leaves that go swirling on, on a river and momentarily they are illuminated by a ray of the sun and then they pass into a mist and they are no longer visible to us but they are there. They are there. Um, when I say they've gone home, I think of my father who is a full-blood Kiowa and when he died some years ago a member of the family came and consoled me and said, Scott, do not feel, do not feel too bad. Your father has gone home. He has returned to the old people who were waiting for him and they have welcomed him with great gladness. And uh, that's how I think of the children of Carlisle as well. They have gone home. Carlisle is a, is, a kind of, is a kind of landmark then. It's a landmark that uh, those children uh, recognized as destinal and they coped with it as best they could. And some of them have very sad stories to tell, I'm thinking of plenty of horses whose story you may know. Um, and then I think too of Jim Thorpe, who thrived at Carlisle and uh, became the best athlete of the 20th century, partly here and partly elsewhere. Um, when I, when uh, Jacqueline noted that I stayed in Jim Thorpe's room, I think I should mention that there the comparison ends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would remind it, I always think of my favorite story about Jim Thorpe. He, he, did, he, he worked uh, at the barn, one of the barns, and uh, on his way home to the dormitory one day, it is said that he passed across Indian Field, the athletic field at Carlisle. And Pop Warner was there instructing some children, some of, the, some of the boys, in the high jump. And in those days it was a standing high jump. And uh, Jim Thorpe came and he watched with interest. He'd never seen such a thing before. And I guess Pop Warner 
was a little put out by this spectator who stood around watching, and finally he said to Thor, can I help you? So he said, what, what, uh, what can I do for you? And Thor said, you want these boys to jump over that bar? And Pop Warner probably thought Thor was being sarcastic. He said, yes, of course, you can see that for yourself. And Thorpe said, I can do that. And he was in his boots and dungarees, coming fresh from the barn. And Pop Warner said, well, if you, if you can clear the bar, do so, please. And Thorpe cleared the bar. And Pop Warner, knowing a good thing when he saw it, kept raising the bar. <laughs> And Thor kept going over the bar. And I have heard, and I'm willing to believe, that that day, Jim Thorpe set a Pennsylvania state record in the high jump. It's one of my favorite stories. I can't do that. I want you to know that. I can't do that. But uh, it was a great thrill for me to, to uh, be where he performed some of his great feats and to uh, uh, stay in the room where he, where he lived. Um, I am Scott Mamaday, but I am also Tsoai Tali, that is my Kiowa name, and it means rock tree boy. Tsoai is what the Kiowas called Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Some of you have been there, others of you have seen photographs of it, and some of you no doubt have seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, <laughs> in which that monolith plays a principal part. It is where the extraterrestrials came down to meet with us earthlings. And, uh, it is a sacred place to the Kyos, and I'll tell you why. Um, well, when I was, when I was uh, less than a year old, I was an infant, my parents took me from my ancestral home in Oklahoma to Devil's Tower, Wyoming. And uh, I don't remember that first trip there, though we've been back many times. Um, but uh, the, the Kiowas tell a story about it. You know, it's, in the, it's on the apron of the Black Hills. And a thousand years ago, more or less, the Kiowas lived in what is now western Montana, near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River. And for some reason, they came down out of the mountains, and they entered upon the Great Plains, and they became a plains people. They encountered the Crow people, who gave them the Sundance religion and who befriended them. And that alliance is, uh, it has been real, and it goes on. I, I remember going up to Crow Agency once to observe the hand game. The Kiowas had sent a delegation of hand game players there, and that, if you, that was a very exciting time. The hand game reaches a frenzy, and uh, it's very interesting to watch as a gambling game. And I uh, was very pleased to meet with some of the Crows, and we talked about our ancient alliance. Crow, when the Kiowas left the Crow people and went down the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains into southwestern Oklahoma, <coughs> Uh, they uh, exchanged children. Sometimes the Kiowas would send ch their children up to live with the crows for a time, and the crows would do the same thing, send their children down. So it's an old, old friendship, and we are greatly indebted to the crows for giving us the Sundance, though the Kiowa Sundance is no more. The last Kiowa Sundance was performed in 1887. And uh, the buffalo had been decimated by that time on the southern plains. And so uh, it was necessary to kill a buffalo bull, which was the sacrificial victim of the Sundance. And when the buffalo was, could no longer be found, the Kairos were, were reduced to buying uh, an animal from a domestic herd which Charles Goodnight preserved in Texas. And in 1890, a buffalo uh, a Sundance was planned, uh, and they were going to suspend an old robe from the sacred tree. They could not have, they could not, uh, they could not find a buffalo to to uh, sacrifice. 
But the soldiers at Fort Sill had, uh, were under orders to prevent the Sundance, and so they did. And that was the last, uh, that was the last Sundance, Kyle Sundance. Um, so I tell you, means rock tree boy. And I was given that name to commemorate my having been taken to Soai, a sacred place in the Black Hills. Now, if you, if you don't know about the monolith, it resembles in conformation the stump of a tree. And it's deeply striated all around. <clears throat> and the, the story that the Kayos, you know, what happens when, when the people encounter something in nature so alien to their experience that it must, you know, they, what do they do? How do they, how do they account for it? And account they must. You know, if they fail to account for it, they repudiate their humanity. Well, of course, you tell a story about it. And the story that the Kairos tell is that there were eight children, eight Kiowa children playing in the woods of the Black Hill. Seven sisters and their brother. The brother was pretending to be a bear and he was chasing his sisters through the woods and the children, the girls, were pretending to be afraid and they were running, running away from the bear. And in the course of this game, the boy actually turned into a bear. And when the girls saw this, they were truly terrified and they ran for their lives and the bear after them. And as they were running through the woods, they passed the stump of a tree, a very large tree stump. And the tree spoke to them and said, if you will climb upon me, I will save you. And so the seven sisters scampered on top of the tree stump, and as they did, it began to rise into the air. And the bear came to kill them, but they were beyond its reach, and it reared up and scored the bark all around with its claws, thus the stri striations. And the story ends, the seven sisters were born into the sky, and they became the stars of the Big Dipper. And that's it, that's the story. So, I have relatives in the night sky. The stars of Ursa Major are my sisters. And uh, the boy, the boy. We know nothing about the boy except that he turned into a bear and he failed to uh, harm his sisters. But you see, by virtue of the fact that I was named for the, for the monolith, I am the reincarnation of that boy. I am a bear, and uh, I don't mean to frighten you. <laughs> uh, you think I'm going to say bear with me, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> that story, by the way, is so meaningful to me because of my name and because I know that place. And I've been there. In fact, I made a vision quest there some years ago. Um, but it seems to me it seems to me to be what a story ought to be. It is a quantum leap of the imagination, isn't it? And it explains something that requires explanation. So it is essential in that respect, and it is sacred. It's a sacred story, and I uh, like to think about that story. Yeah. It's as perfect a story as I know, I think. It is imaginative. And I want to talk to you this evening about the imagination to some extent. Um, the story, until I wrote it down in a book, called The Way to Rainy Mountain, was never written. It was an oral story. And the oral tradition is the matrix of Native American culture. I am a professor of English. I'm emeritus now. But I taught uh, for many years on 
college campuses here and there, and overseas. And the oral, I taught a course in the oral tradition almost every year that I, that I was on duty. And I, I know something about the oral tradition. I have a great respect for it. And I want to tell you something about it. Um, when I was just a child, again, about the age of, uh, about the age I was when I was taken to Devil's Tower, to so I, my father told me stories from the Kiowa oral tradition. I listened to them with great, great love and interest, and I had him tell me the stories again and again and again. And they were fixed then in my mind. And not until I was well into my adulthood did I understand that those stories were very fragile and that they were on the verge of extinction. You know, the, that's, that's something to note about the oral tradition. If something in that tradition is not passed on from generation to generation by word of mouth, it's lost forever. And so, on the one hand, the oral tradition may seem very fragile. On the other, it's very strong and it has a vitality that writing does not have. Now, I'm a writer, so I can say terrible things about writing I want to, uh, and I sometimes do. Um, but, you know, I tell my students, I've told my students for many years that um, in, in writing, we have a false security where language is concerned. We know that we can write something down on a piece of paper, and we can put it in a desk drawer, and it'll be there when we come back for it. And this gives us a, a sense of security. But in, in some ways, it is a false security. In the oral tradition, we don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury of putting something away and, uh, and having it wait there for our return. Um, so one can say this about the oral tradition. It is more vital than writing. It depends upon three things in particular, things that uh, are apart from writing. One is that in the oral tradition, one must speak with great authority, with great responsibility. The storyteller has a great uh, burden of responsibility. So he doesn't waste words. The listener must listen with great care because if he fails to hear what is said, it is gone. And three, he must remember what he hears. Those are three things upon which the oral tradition depends. And th those things are not true of writing. So, we have the oral tradition that exists in our time. It's, it's a very, it is very strong in, in spite of the fact that it is also fragile. And it is mysterious in certain ways. I have encountered stories that uh, seem to skip a generation. And I don't know why or how that works, but it seems to happen. Fails to be passed on to one generation, but it shows up in the next generation. How can that be? That seems to be in the nature of language. And language is the great, um, uh, great common denominator of literature and oral tradition. I like to think of a story um, <clears throat> that I invented. It's my story, and I'm going to tell it to you, um, whether you like it or not. <laughs> thousand years ago, there was a child who lived in a small village. And one day, the child's parents awakened her or him. I like to think of this child as a girl. And they said, get up, get up. We've got to go to the forest. We've got to go into the forest. So the little girl woke up and didn't know what was going on. But her parents led her to the forest and they came to a clearing. And the people from the village gathered around. They were all waiting. They were waiting and the little girl didn't know what was happening. And then after a time, 
there came a hush upon the crowd. And the little man stepped into the center, into the clearing. And he was wearing, as I think of it, he was wearing a hood and a kind of cloak. And he was bent over, he was very old. And he stood for a moment in the, in the center. Everybody paid him attention. And then he began to speak. And he recites a story. I think in my version of, of, the, of the story, my first version of it, he recited the Beowulf, which is the oldest poem in the English language. And so this took place in England, say, in the seventh century. And the child, who had never had such an experience before, was enthralled, completely captivated, her imagination was ignited, perhaps for the first time. And it was a day that she never forgot the rest of her life. She had discovered the magic of literature, the magic of words. And the oral tradition is full of such experiences. And so you can understand the, the sacred nature of the oral tradition if you think of it in those terms. Um, <clears throat> so the oral tradition is the matrix of culture. Can't do without it. And every one of us in this room has an oral tradition. You probably don't think of it, but you have it. You tell stories in your daily lives. You converse with each other. You rely upon language in ways that you, uh, are, of which you are probably not aware. Language is sacred. How did language begin? Do you know? Have you ever thought about that? How did language begin? I was once on a platform with Richard Leakey, a very famous, <coughs> what is he, an anthropologist, I guess discovered Turkana Boy. And uh, he and I were in Chicago, and we were on stage together, and we were talking about origins. And one of the things we discussed was the origin of human being. And Richard Leakey said, well, we became human when we became bipedal, when we stood upon our hind legs, and we could reach the fruit up above our heads, and see out over the plain and so on. And uh, I said, Richard, no, that is not so. That is not so. We became human when we acquired language. And of course I was right. <laughs> <laughs> the, great, uh, the great scientist and writer Lewis Thomas has a book called The Fragile Species and in it there is a chapter on communication and he says, I think I know how language began. There were people living in caves. They couldn't speak in any proper way. They, they were trying hard to communicate with each other. They were having a terrible time. They were grunting and groaning and whistling and so on. And uh, then one day, one day, a neighboring tribe came across the ridge into the community and they brought their children with them and suddenly there was a critical mass of children and the children played all day long and at the end of that day we had language. I like that because it rings true to my experience. Uh, children love to play, play with words, and they are not afraid of language, as most of us are. So I like that story, and I can believe that it's true. When my daughter, one of my daughters, was a little thing, about three years old, as I recall, I was living in Santa Barbara at the time, and I was cooking on the patio on an abachi, and she came up to me, this little, this little thing, you know, and she took me by the hand and she said, Daddy, is it tomorrow yet? 
That completely confounded me. I think I said, go ask your mother. But when I, when I thought about what was going on in her mind, it was one of the great moments in her life, and in mine. She had come upon something so profound that there was no answer to it. No, it was not tomorrow yet, and tomorrow never comes. How do you tell that to a child? How does the child accommodate that in her thinking? It was a great moment, and uh, it has something to do with the story of the children coming across the ridge and inventing language. Well, I am Kiowa. Ky the Kiowas are a Southern Plains tribe. And they migrated down, as I say, from the, from the Yellowstone country to the, their present location of southwestern Oklahoma, near Rainy Mountain. And I once wrote a book called The Way to Rainy Mountain, which is a collection of Kiowa oral tales. And uh, so I, I think a lot about their migration and so on. And, uh, they, were, they became a warrior society. They were hunters. They acquired horses in the course of their migration. And they, they had more horses per capita than any other tribe on the Great Plains. By the way, there were eight tribes on the Great Plains. And uh, the Kiowas were one, a late, late coming tribe to the group. But they all had some of the Sundance. And they were all horse people. And, and observed a warrior, a warrior ideal. There were four principles that informed the warrior ideal of the Kayas. They were bravery, steadfastness, generosity, and truth. Truth being virtue or appropriate behavior in all circumstances. And these, they lived, they lived according to those principles through their golden age, which lasted about a hundred years from, say, 1780 or so. And uh, in, in alliance with the Comanches, an older tribe on the, on the southern plains, they ruled the southern plains for that period of a hundred years. It was the golden age. Well, I like to think of that, you know, I think, because when I think about native wisdom, Ah, uh, here's a good example. Bravery, steadfastness, generosity, truth. Those are good things, you know, to, to observe. They are good, a good code to live by, if you will. Well, it's no longer, you know, those principles no longer hold. The, uh, <clears throat> the plains culture came down in the 19th century, as you know. And, um, so the warrior, the, the society, the warrior society was no more. The Indians suffered a terrible defeat. Uh, they lost in a 10-year period or a 20-year period everything. Their religion, their economy, their way of life. They were devastated. By the turn of the century, by the turn of the 19th century, the death rate had begun to exceed the birth rate. The sense of depression, desperation, was so pronounced that it is still with us. It is still with us. You know, the, the, the Native American has a higher mortality rate than the rest of us. Um, suicide is cancerous. Diabetes, I, I lived in Tucson for some years in the nearby Pima tribe. 90% of them had diabetes. So they're, they're way, it's, uh, they have not come out of the woods yet. They're still in darkness. And there is a kind of, of uh, genetic despair among Indian people. It's been going on for some time. They seem to be taking some strides out of it, but they have a long way to go. They have a long way to go. 
And I rem I'm, I'm reminded again of the children at Carlisle, you know. They were desperate, they were desperate. Got on a train in the West and came, and by the way, they'd never been on a train before. They probably thought of it as a terrible monster and they should have been frightened by it. But they came by train. They came into a hostile situation. Their hair was cut off. They were made to wear military uniforms. They were forbidden to speak their native language. You cannot, can you imagine the trauma of that experience? And these were children. These were children, you know, they were. And children are sacred beings. Children are sacred beings. They are innocent. They are innocent. They are taught as they grow older to be less than innocent, many of them. But when they come into the world, I have to think of these newborn creatures coming in and being like, uh, like the, like tablets on which you write their future. They are sacred beings. And you are sacred beings, too. I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. But, uh, I think that the four principles of the warrior society of the Plains people, those principles have been supplanted they have been uh, turned into other principles which are much more appropriate in our time. And I would name these four. Source. Source. Purpose. Humility. And imagination. Those things belong to the Native American in spades. And I'll tell you stories to illustrate each of those principles. Um, source is, is perhaps the simplest and most difficult to define. Source. What do I mean by source? The Native American has at the center of his being something that is truly important and indispensable. I call it source, but it can be called energy, center, soul. My grandmother was a bead worker. Into her 80s, she could bead. And uh, she told me stories when I was a little boy. And she could remember things that um, belonged to her center. For example, she could talk about the Black Hills, where she had never been. And we're talking about a kind of blood memory. And that is a, that is a great thing among Native people, blood memory. Uh, I like to tell my students that Oh, you know, I, I remember things that happened a while ago. I remember crossing the Bering Bridge in the last ice age. Oh, I had a dog. Dog pulled a trap away. I hunted mammoths. And I had furs to keep me warm because it was cold on the Bering Bridge. God, it was cold. I remember that. I once told a class that, and uh, I had term papers, and one of the term papers was written by a young lady who said, Dr. Momaday remembers being on the Bering Bridge. <laughs> it was cold. God, it was cold. <laughs> Gave her name, of course. <laughs> so that source is 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 something that uh, the native person is aware of and and stands to instruct us in that uh, in that way. Um, 
source, that's important. You have a source, of course. You must, I'm sure that some of you have, have determined your source and you are aware of it. And you know that it is immortal, that it is very powerful. And uh, you must nurture it, you must care for it. Um, <clears throat> can't help thinking of a little verbal uh, formula that is Chippewa, I think, in, uh, in origin. It goes like this. As my eyes search the prairie, I feel the summer in the spring. It's a very beautiful and very powerful, and it puts a finger on evanescence, a moment so small in time that it is easily overlooked. But that is, that, that issues from the source of the observer. I've had the same experience uh, looking out over a landscape that I love, and I've had the sense that it has if I could hold on to this moment in time, it would be great. But even as I express the wish, the moment passes. But you have it. You have it and you don't lose it. You remember it. It becomes a part of your oral tradition. The second principle, purpose, We all, need, we all need to have a purpose, don't we? We need to be useful. We need to guide our lives in the direction of purpose. Tell you a story about that. I was teaching at the University of Alaska Fairbanks several years ago. I spent a semester there. Temperature got down to 47 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. <laughs> I went out to visit a small native village some, some distance away from Fairbanks, but way out, you know, driving through this snow-filled landscape and seeing the ice crystals on all the trees. It was magical. And when I got to the village, there was a kind of feast, a kind of feast going on and men were cooking moose meat in the streets on open fires. And then at a certain point, they went to the community house, which is a large building, and uh, I went in, and a lot was going on. There were many people, and they were all being vociferous, and they were celebrating. There were even dances in that hall that evening. And uh, I was having a great time just observing. I'd never seen a situation just like that. And uh, there was a dance in which one of, the, one of the dancers, the lead dancer, was a young man whose name was Ivan. And I watched him because he was a superb dancer. The dance was a kind of serpentine line, which, and they danced backwards. And they looked this direction and there, that, as if hunting, looking for prey. Their gaze was intense. And none was more intense than Ivan. And so I called someone over and I said, that, that boy, who is that? Oh, Ivan, that's Ivan. He's, a, he's, a, he's not quite right in his head. And he has a sad story. Some time ago, he wanted more than anything in the world to join his peers in school. But because of his mental deficiency, he was not allowed to go to school. And so he was very sad, dejected, and he wandered around aimlessly. One day, as he was walking through a street in a village, an old woman came out of her house and beckoned to him. Ivan, Ivan, come. So he went to see what she wanted, and she said, Ivan, I have no water. I have no water. Would you take my bucket, my pail, and go down to the river and bring me water? Yes, he would do that. Now, the way down to the river was treacherous. It was in a 
deep ravine, and the ravine was full of snow and ice. The footing was very treacherous. But he did it, and he brought her a pail of water. And the next thing you know, you, you knew, uh, someone else had seen what had happened, and they asked him to bring them water. And so he started a little business there, bringing water from the river. He was strong, he could do that with ease. And he became the water boy of the village. And he achieved a purpose in his life. He was no longer bereft. He had been fulfilled in a certain way. And that is something that uh, the Native American treasures to and, and can teach us something about. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. Now the third, the third is humility. Humility. The Native American is rich in humility. My late friend, Vine Deloria Jr., told me a story about a Navajo man who lived in the Chushka Mountains of New Mexico. And he said that this man had lost his job, and so he was without an income. And he had a wife, a pregnant wife, and several children to take care of. And um, he was in a bad way. One day a friend came to visit, and the friend said to the man, I see that you are having trouble. You, you, you have uh, uh, no work and many mouths to feed. Now I know you to be a hunter. Why don't you go kill a deer so that you and your family can have fresh meat to eat? And the man thought for a moment and then replied, no, you see, it is inappropriate that I should take life just now when I am expecting the gift of life. I love that story. It's an example of true humility, I think. And uh, I know of other such stories. And humility is uh, something that we gain through thought and prayer and hard work, a good example. But it is real and it enriches us, doesn't it? It is good to be humble, to have humility. All right, the fourth and last of these principles is imagination. That too is very difficult to define. Um, what is the imagination? I ask a class here at, at uh, Dickinson College uh, yesterday or the day before, what is, what is the imagination? And uh, I didn't have any immediate uh, volunteers to answer. But I, it's, the imagination is something that I have thought about as a writer and a storyteller for many years. And I define the imagination as that which enables us to see beyond reality. And that is a great thing, you know. Writers and artists and creative people know about that. How do you distinguish between imagination and reality? Well, you see the mountain but you imagine the valley on the other side. I think I quoted a poem by Theodore Retti uh, yesterday. And the, the poem is very short, but it's very powerful. It goes like this. When I saw that clumsy crow flat from a wasted tree, the shape in the mind grew up. Over the gulfs of dream flew a tremendous bird, farther and farther away into a moonless black, back in the brain, far back. <laughs> Shudder, I think of that one. It's ominous. But it is a wonderful example of reality, which is the crow and the imagination, which is the tremendous bird, flying into darkness. It's a beautiful poem. So the imagination, the imagination. Um, when I was uh, 
writing The Way to Rainy Mountain, I was looking for old Kiowa stories. I, I, was, I went to Oklahoma and I talked to people, Kiowas there, and I said, who can tell me, who can tell me stories? I want to see them. I want stories from the oral tradition. Well, I kept hearing the name Kosan, Kosan, old woman of the tribe. And I was told that she knew more about Kaya history, lore, storytelling than anyone else. And so my father and I went to call upon Kosan. She lived out in the boondocks and we had to drive a considerable distance to find her. But we did. And, uh, we talked to her daughter and told uh, the daughter that we wanted to interview Kosan. We wanted, to, we wanted her to tell us stories. Would that be all right? And the daughter said, yes, that would probably be all right. Uh, I will ask her. And tomorrow, you come back and uh, you may talk to her. Well, my father and I then went back to my grandparents' house, which was some miles away. And we prepared a feast for Kosan. And uh, the next day we went and picked her up, brought her to the, to the Mamadete, the Mamade homestead, and uh, did her a great honor. And she was little and fragile. And she sat on a bench in the arbor. And she was hunched over on herself like this. And I thought she was going to keel over at any moment. But no, no, she had more energy and a better memory than uh, I had. But I asked her questions. I, and she could not speak English. I could not speak Kaya. So my father intervened and uh, interpreted. And uh, I said, Grandmother, Grandmother, um, what can you tell me about the sun dance? Because I knew that as a child, she had attended the last Kyle sun dance, 1887. And uh, I would ask her such a question and she would say, oh, 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 don't, don't ask about that. That's too far back. No one, no one knows anything about that. And then having made this protestation, she would answer the question in minute detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, what she remembered about the sun dance was fascinating. She said, well, you know, they had to kill a buffalo and suspend its head from the, from the tree in the, in the sun dance law, sacrificial victim. The sun dance fetish, the most powerful medicine in the tribe, called Taime, had to be exposed in the, in the dance line. And uh, she said, and then, you know, I was just a girl and I was sleepy in my teepee. And, and uh, my sisters came and they awakened me. They said, come, come, you've got to come out. Uh, you've got to see. And she said she walked out of the teepee and the camp was more beautiful than she had ever seen it before. Everything had been cleaned and was fresh, and there were pennants hanging from the teepees. It was just a wonderful sight. And then she said, and then we saw an old woman off in the distance. She was approaching, and the old woman had something on her back. And the, the children of the rabbit society went out to see what it was she had on her back. This was a custom of ritual. The old woman had a bag full of earth on her back. It was a certain kind of sandy earth. That is what the dancers must have in the lodge. They must dance upon the sandy earth. The old woman held a digging tool in her hand, and she pointed towards the south, and pointed with her lips, it was like a kiss, and she began to sing. As now we have brought the earth, now it is time to play. As old as I am, I still have the feeling of play. 
That's how the Sundance began. That's how it always began. Well, you know, I was so deep into my conversation with her, my question. I asked her a thousand questions that afternoon, and she answered every one. Um, tangentially. Oh, no, don't ask me that. <laughs> and then she answered the question. So, her imagination was alive. The whole Sundance was an act of the imagination in a way. You know, it was a prayer for, for well-being, successful hunting. Um, it was the, the principal ceremony of the tribe. And uh, I have this dream, I have this dream. I have a foundation which is called the Buffalo Trust, which I founded some years ago. The purpose of the Buffalo Trust is to help indigenous peoples hold on to their traditional value. And it has been, it has been successful. Um, I, have, uh, I have worked in parts of the United States, particularly in the Southwest, worked in Alaska among Alaskan natives, and I've worked in Siberia among the Hanti and the Nenets and the Mansi peoples. And I, the Buffalo Trust is responsible for saving one of the great ceremonies among the Hanti people, a bear ceremony. And it was being lost because it was not being passed down to the next generation. So the uh, Buffalo Trust interceded and we managed to arrange the, the few elders still in possession of the songs to teach them to younger people. And now, <clears throat> the bear ceremony has returned. So, I want, I, the Buffalo Trust went dormant for a time because of the uh, death in the family and such reason. Now I want to revive it. And you know what I want to do? I want the Buffalo Trust to bring back the Sundance to the guy of people. I don't know that that's possible. A generation ago, it seemed impossible. So I would talk to people, hey, wouldn't it be great to bring the Sundance back? Oh, no, no, we can't do that. We don't know what it is. We've forgotten that, you know. It's been too long since we had a Sundance. We wouldn't know how to, to reinstate it. But the younger people, now, they have a different mindset and they're much more interested in bringing the Sundance back. And the crows gave it to us. We could go up and talk to the crows and use their Sundance as a model, which must be very close to the Kaya Sundance. We could, uh, the, the tiny bundle, the, the chief uh, religious fetish of the Sundance, Kaya Sundance, is, is extant. It's still there. So we could bring it back. <coughs> Well, that's one of the, one of the things I have now. And uh, as a principal purpose, though, I want to help children, because children are sacred beings. I would like to, I would like to tell as many people as I can about the great experiment of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. What was good about it and what was bad about it? and how so many children attended the school, some of them remain in the ground at the school, and they are engaged in that journey that I mentioned at the outset, you know, the journey from life to death, from mortality to immortality, towards being, being sacred being. And you are sacred beings. We are all sacred beings and we must celebrate our sacred nature. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you.
mobile microphones. Yes. So if you'd like to put up your hand if you have a question. How do you see the imagination that you speak to and speak about? Oh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Whitney Hall, uh, for your remarks. And it, they moved me deeply. And what I'd like to ask is, how do you see the sense of imagination that you speak about so eloquently in our troubled time? That's a very good question. And by the way, it looks as if Kavanaugh has, been, has become a member of the Supreme Court. We seem to live in a, in a, a poverty of the imagination now in many ways. Um, I'm distressed when I listen to the news and uh, I, I find uh, the, the status of the United States declining around the world. And uh, sometimes I want to give up and uh, say, to heck with it, I'm not going to bother with watching the news anymore. So, but I think uh, it is fair to say that by the strength of the imagination, we will we will return to our, our former well-being. What goes around comes around. The pendulum will swing back, and we will overcome the, the uh, crises that afflict us today. And if we do, it will be largely because we imagine who and what and that we are. And we will do that with bravery, steadfastness, generosity, and truth. Is that, is that very hopeful? And back to Carlisle. I moved here from Frederick to be near the cemetery and a vision is manifested and I can share it now that this has happened. Last time I saw you was at Hood College and you had, were speaking there and it was before the idea of a film about the Carlisle Indian School. I think the result of that was your book, if you wouldn't mind signing afterwards about your, your plays. I, the question has to do with a screenplay about the Carlisle Indian Industrial School with your help and assistance. Is that something that will happen? Yes. When? <laughs> Tell us more about it. We begin tonight. Okay. <laughs> and how does it start? By the way, I should mention in connection with this uh, question that um, I have written a play about the Carlisle School. <laughs> It's called, um, the name of the play is The Moon in Two Windows. And that title is taken from the fact that one of the children who came to Carlisle on a train um, looked out the train window and saw the moon. And then he crossed over to the other side of the train and he saw the moon. It was a great mystery to him because it seemed that the moon had flown across the sky when in fact just the train made a turn. But it was magical to him, and he took it very seriously. He was, was disturbed by it. And um, in, that, uh, in that play as well, I, I do mention Jim Thorpe and the great uh, college football game against Army in 1912, when Thorpe took White Eisenhower out of the game, uh, rather roughly. <laughs> He had been talking to some of his classmates at night in this kind of secret meeting, and uh, some of the boys were reminiscing about the Battle of Washita in Oklahoma, 1868, and uh, Custer had killed Black Kettle and his wife in the middle of the Washita River, and uh, Custer's men had decimated that band, 
And then they pursued the Indians, and they killed all of their horses. And so I had Thorpe walking off the field after the game, and he sees an army player walking off the field as well, and he says to the army player, we will not pursue you, and we will not kill your horses. Is that pretty? <laughs> I wanted to return to the imagination, if I could. Um, the Buddhists say that you sit on the mat to meditate in order to get real, in order to be real. Um, in other words, to um, come face to face with maybe the illusions or fantasies that kind of occupy our minds and um, kind of the stories we tell ourselves that help us get through our day, or the distractions, or whatever. Um, and so there's this insistence on being real, in other words, being honest. And I, I think this, this conference, a lot of it is about being honest. So how do we engage with what is real and bring the imagination into that? I mean, how do we put those two worlds together? Do you know what I mean? I think so, and, I, and I, I appreciate that question very much. The, the distinction between reality and the imagination is real, of course. And uh, in the comparison, I think uh, the imagination doesn't come out as well as it should in most instances. I think reality is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, <laughs> I, I prefer, because I'm a writer and a painter and, and uh, come from a very creative household, uh, I, I prefer the imagination. Um, it, it seems to me more vital in certain ways. When I think of, of Devil's Tower, for example, you know, the question is, well, was it a tree or not? Well, most people will say, not. You know, it, scientifically, it's, it's a volcanic core, perhaps, and it's made of phono, phonolite porphyry. And I say, no, it's a tree. And then the other day, I found out that under this mammoth feature in the landscape, there is a gigantic root system. So, of course, it's a tree. <laughs> so I'm thinking about the fact that there are two educational institutions in Carlisle that are so prominent. One is the Carlisle Industrial School, Indian Industrial School, and the other is Dickinson College. And actually they did exist simultaneously for that period of time. And there were students from the Carlisle Indian School who did actually attend Dickinson College. And there has been a convergence, which has been really heartening and important, uh, beginning, I think, with the power, but really incarnated in these conferences that have either taken place at Dickinson or have allowed for an interplay between native scholars and storytellers and artists and poets and uh, folks from the historical society who have been so important. I'm thinking about the future, though, because the conferences have been sporadic. And when you were here before, and you were talking about the significance of Carlisle, the word to Native Americans, that it struck a deep and frightening chord. And I thought about how perhaps few of the, our first-year students coming here might have any resonance with the word Carlisle, except maybe for the car shows, and might even graduate with not knowing that history. So I'm um, wondering how, uh, my vision is that any student who graduated from Dickinson would know something about that deeper meaning of Carlisle. But I wonder if we could use imagination, could you help us think about 
ways in which the college could uh, enhance uh, the, the support of the storytelling of Native American cultures that wouldn't just be in conferences, but would be ongoing. Well, thank you. Yes, I, I, uh, I think that, um, I, I, by the way, I have, every time I come, uh, a greater appreciation of Dickinson College. I think it must be one of the fine colleges in the country. And I've had a little to do with it. I've, had, I've been meeting with students, and so I'm very much impressed with it. I don't know how many Dickinson students know about Carlisle, but they ought to know about it because it is one of the great historical places in the country. What happened there was a great moment to all of us, not only to Native Americans, <coughs> but to non-Indian people as well. And, uh, you know, for, for a resident of, of Carlisle or a student at Dickinson College, uh, not to know about the Carlisle Indian Industrial School would be something like someone living in Gettysburg without knowing about the battle there. It's, it's, a, a, it's, such, a, it's such a profound thing and we ought to know of it. So if you don't, for heaven's sake, learn. Learn about it. It's a fascinating subject. Scott, I want to say on behalf of everybody here that the, one of the themes that has come up through this conference has been the importance of story. So on behalf of everyone, thank you for coming from New Mexico to honor us with some of your Kiowa stories.